Hello cutie, I'm back. And today we're doing another episode of Beauty and the Bibliophile. If you're new here, welcome to my channel and welcome to The Cute Life. I'm your cult leader, Leah. If you're not new here, thank you for returning for another cult meeting. As often as I can, I do a series called Beauty and the Bibliophile, where I do my makeup and I tell you about the latest book that I've read. If you don't know what a bibliophile is, it is a lover and collector of books like me. Today's book is When You Wish Upon a Star, The Twisted Tale of the Blue Fairy. What if the Blue Fairy wasn't supposed to help Pinocchio? Now. Before we get started, spoiler alerts, I do summarize the book, though I cannot go into everything for the sake of time. You will know the ending of the book, so just be warned if you're thinking about reading this book and you don't want to know anything about it, don't watch this video. If you're thinking that you might want to read this book but you're not sure, or you don't want to read this book and you just want to hear a summary of it, then keep watching. Also, I'm going to assume that you've seen the movie Pinocchio that this book is based on. If you haven't, I would highly suggest you go and watch it before watching this video or reading this book because you might be a little lost. I'm going to be speaking to you as if you have seen the movie. So, just so you know, watch the movie first. So, if you want to hear a summary of the backstory of the Blue Fairy and watch me do my makeup at the same time, well then stay tuned. Okay, so, When You Wish Upon a Star by Elizabeth Lim. And this book came out in April of 2023, so it just came out. And it's the latest book in the Twisted Tale series. So this story starts uh, on a late night in the town of Pariva and the blue fairy is looking over the town and she's listening to people's wishes. Now she wasn't allowed to actually grant any of the wishes that she heard because Pariva is the town where she grew up and it was against the fairy rules to grant wishes to anybody that you used to know. But then she heard a voice wishing that sounded very familiar. And the voice was saying, starlight, star bright, the first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might, have the wish I wish tonight. And then the blue fairy realized that this voice was Geppetto and she hadn't seen him in like 40 years and almost didn't even recognize him. Then she heard Geppetto say to his cat, Figaro, he's like, Figaro, he's like, do you know what I wished for? And he tells the cat that he wished that his little Pinocchio, the little wooden puppet that he had just got done building, would be a real boy. And when uh, the Blue Fairy heard this, she felt kind of sad. She could sense the loneliness in him. She knew that, you know, he was a toy maker and that his toys brought joy to all the little children in the village and that, you know, he had company during the day from these little children, but his nights were very lonely and she took pity on him and she had compassion for him. And she also felt a little bit guilty about his place in life. But she went to leave trusting that another fairy would tend to his wish. And she went to leave, but then something in her heart, she just couldn't. And her little dove companion that she had with her was like cooing at her, like, you know, you're not supposed to do this, you should leave. And you know, in all honesty, she wasn't even supposed to be in Pariva at all. But she looked at the little bird and she was like, no, no, no. So she waited for Geppetto to go to sleep 
and then she entered his house through an open window. Now, it wasn't within the fairy rules to give life to inanimate objects uh, on a permanent basis, <laughs> um, but the blue fairy just could not bring herself to leave Geppetto without granting his wish because she could really feel the pain emanating from this man who was actually very noble and had done a lot of good for the world and brought a lot of love to children. And her conscience just wouldn't let it go. And as a fairy, her very first lesson was to always follow your conscience. So she walked up to Pinocchio and she pointed her wand at him and she said, little puppet made of pine, wake. The gift of life is thine. And then Pinocchio kind of woke up, kind of wiggled to life. And he was like, I can move. And he's like, oh, I can talk. She was like, yes, Pinocchio, I've given you life. And Pinocchio was like, why? And she said, because tonight Geppetto wished for a real boy. And he said, oh, is that what I am? Am I a real boy? And she was like, no, Pinocchio, to make Geppetto's wish come true will be entirely up to you. And she, and he's like, up to me? She's like, yes. She said, prove yourself brave, truthful, and unselfish, and someday you will be a real boy. And you know, the blue fairy was thinking to herself, she's like, I've got to find a way for this to actually happen. Geppetto deserved it. Pinocchio deserved it. But, you know, a wooden boy is bound to find himself in some trouble, uh, especially one as new to life as Pinocchio was. So he would need something to guide him along to help him. He needed a conscience. Now, she noticed a little cricket eavesdropping on their conversation, and I guess she thought, oh, he'll do. So she explained everything to the cricket, and she knighted Sir Jiminy Cricket, Pinocchio's official conscience. Then she said to Pinocchio, she's like, remember, be a good boy and let your conscience guide you and someday you will be a real boy. And then she disappeared and went out the window, though she did kind of linger around outside, kind of listening to Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket talk things out. Okay, I'm going to let my skincare sit in for a few minutes before we move on to makeup. And while she was outside, she heard a voice behind her say, Oh, still making promises you know you can't keep. Hmm, some things never change. And the blue fairy recognized the voice immediately. She turns around and it's the scarlet fairy. The scarlet fairy's like, oh, it's been a long time. And the blue fairy, she's like, well, I do intend to keep my promise to Pinocchio. He's a good lad and I'm sure that the other fairies will see so too. Plus Pinocchio seems like he'd be a wonderful addition to the world. And I know that the other fairies will agree. And the Scarlet Fairy's like, but what if Pinocchio isn't worthy? I mean, what if he doesn't prove himself brave, truthful, and unselfish? I mean, he is a puppet. <laughs> he doesn't have a heart. And the Blue Fairy's like, please don't interfere. And the Scarlet Fairy is like, oh, well, that's my job. She's like, why wouldn't I? Then I would be falling down on my responsibilities. And she's like, you know, who would have thought that a after all these years, Kiara, you would be the one to falter from your responsibilities. But, you know, at the same time, I shouldn't be surprised. You're not as loyal as you make everyone think you are. So the blue fairy's name is Kiara. And the Scarlet Fairy was like, you know, once all the wishing fairies see what, you know, a bad little boy Pinocchio is, you'll have to change him back. And then how sad will old Geppetto be then? And the blue fairy's like, you wouldn't. And the scarlet fairy's like, oh yes, I would. Unless you make a little wager with me. It's gonna be, you know, harmless or are you too 
righteous and the uh, blue fairy she's like well coming from you i really doubt that it's harmless then the scarlet fairy was like you know it might actually be pretty beneficial for pinocchio you know if you win because if you win i won't tell the other fairies what you've done and i'll even help you make pinocchio into a real boy and the blue fairy was like you would help me and the scarlet fairy's like well yeah if you win now kiara was in a <laughs> tough spot because if she left now you know said no to the wager and left back to the wishing star and told all the other fairies what was going on the scarlet fairy would take advantage of her not being around and involve little pinocchio in some crazy plot and all the other fairies would probably unanimously vote to change pinocchio back and she would most likely probably lose her wand and her wings and quite possibly be cast out from the fairies forever. So she looks at the Scarlet Fairy and she's like, name your term, sister. So they're sisters. Now Kiara had just turned 18 and she was known as the kindest girl in town. Everybody loved her. But her sister, Alaria, she was kind of known as the local prima donna. But despite how everyone else felt about Alaria, Kiara still considered her her best friend. Now, most people in Pariva, they actually wanted to get out of Pariva. It was that kind of town, right? Everybody dreamt of leaving, finding fame and fortune, but not Kiara. Kiara loved her little town, unlike her sister who wanted to be a famous opera singer. And she, you know, she actually had the talent to become uh, an opera singer. She actually had an audition set up in, you know, their major city, which was called Valon. And she was going to be auditioning for a very famous opera singer named Maria Linda. And she was going to have the opportunity to see if she could study under her. And Alaria, every time she saw the wishing star, she would wish, wish, wish that it comes true, that she gets into the conservatory and gets to become a famous opera singer. Kiara, on the other hand, she was a lot more practical. She didn't really believe in magic or wishes that were granted by fairies. Now, one very hot day, Kiara, Alaria, and their brother, Niccolo, they wanted to take their little rowboat out onto the sea since it was so hot and they thought it would cool them off. Now, while they were out at sea, they were like playing with one of those telescopes and looking around and they spied a whale's tail like coming out of the water and it was a few miles away from them. And they were a little concerned about this because there had been a lot of rumors going around that there was this terrible uh, whale named Monstro that was just destroying ships and a few sailors had died. Now the hairs on the back of Kiara's neck stood up. She had a terrible feeling. She could feel evil in the air and in the sea. And she didn't know how she knew, but she just knew that something bad was about to happen. And she gets the telescope again and she's scanning the horizon and she sees um, a ship all broken apart. There's debris everywhere and she see the sail just like floating on the water and then in the midst of all this debris she sees a pair of arms like flailing around screaming help help and she's like oh my goodness there's somebody out there so she kicks off her shoes and she goes diving into the water so she's swimming towards the victim and it's hard like there's waves and she's struggling and she hears a voice in her ear. It's not her own voice. It's the voice of a woman that she doesn't recognize. And it says, you know, come on, Kiara, you can do it. She's like, keep fighting. And this encourages her to keep going. So she finally makes it to this young man and she recognizes him from their village. He's like, kind of got his arms wrapped around a log and he's unconscious, unconscious, unconscious. And she grabs him and starts swimming back to their boat. Now her brother and sister, they come rowing up and they help 
get him into the boat and Kiara. So they're able to revive this young man and Niccolo, he's like, oh, he's like, you're um, Geppetto, you're the Lutherer's son. A Lutherer uh, makes and repairs musical instruments. And incidentally, Geppetto had a major crush on Alaria. So Geppetto is thanking Chiara profusely and Chiara, she's like, oh, well, you should be thanking Alaria. She was kind of, you know, playing a little bit of matchmaker here or trying to. And she said, you know, it was her idea that we bring the boat out. So if it hadn't been for her, we would have been out here at all. We wouldn't have seen you. And so Geppetto is, you know, embarrassed. He's very shy and he has to talk to his crush now, but he thanks her so much for her help. So they began their row home and Niccolo asked Geppetto, he's like, what happened? And Geppetto tells everyone that a whale had capsized his boat. And Niccolo's like, oh, monstro. And Geppetto's like, what's a monstro? <laughs> and Niccolo's like, oh, you really need to get out of your father's workshop some more. Everybody knows about monstro. Anyway, so they row home, but nobody noticed the sinister magic that was oozing out of the distant sea. Now, one day when Alaria was leaving the house to go to work, she had a little job in a hat shop and she had this little job to um, save money for her singing lessons and for a new dress that she needed for her audition and her travel expenses, all that stuff. Anyway, she's on her way to work and right outside her house, she sees like a little orb of like shimmering light go past her. And she's looking at it really closely and she could make out like little wings fluttering within it. And she's like, what the heck? Now this orb was about half the size of her fist, so it was too big to be like a firefly. And it was this, you know, shimmery violet light, no bird <laughs> emanated light like that. So then she was like, oh, it's probably a fairy. Remember, she believes in magic and fairies and all that stuff. And she's thinking like, what would a fairy be doing here? Oh, maybe it heard my wish and she's, here to grant my wish. And she watches the little orb of light go into an open window in their house. She rushes inside, she tiptoes up the stairs following the fairy, and then she sees the fairy go into Kiara's room. And she's thinking to herself, what would a fairy want with Kiara? Kiara doesn't even believe in magic or fairies. So Alaria goes up to her sister's door and she presses her ear again. She's trying to hear what's going on. And she could hear them talking, but she couldn't make out what they were saying. And she wanted so badly to just kind of like barge open the door, pretending like she didn't know there was anybody in there and just be like, hey sister, <laughs> you know. Um, but she has respect for fairies. so. She used a little bit of restraint, but after a while, she just couldn't take it anymore. She goes barging in. She's like, hey, Kiara, but there's nobody in there. They had disappeared, but she wasn't too worried about it. I mean, Kiara would tell her everything when she got back. I mean, they were sisters. They didn't keep secrets from each other. Now this fairy, she was the Violet Fairy and her and Kiara, you know, they had gone to an, another part of the town or the seaside or something like that. And she told Kiara that they wanted her to become an apprentice and possibly become a fairy herself. Now this Violet Fairy, her name was Agata and she was a member of the oldest uh, school of fairies that there was. And they listened to wishes made in good faith and they guarded the love, hope, and wonder in the hearts of all. Then Kiara realized, she's like, oh, this is the voice that I heard when I was rescuing Geppetto. Now, apparently, Agata was about to save Geppetto herself. Then out of nowhere came Kiara, and Kiara, she needed no magic to answer this call for help. So, you know, the fairies, they realized that Kiara had a talent for seeing into people's hearts 
and for helping them. So Agata told Kiara to think on it for a week, that she would be back in a week for her answer. She also told her not to tell anyone about this, not her parents, not her brother, not her sister, because she didn't want anyone influencing her decision. So Kiara agreed she would think about it for the next week and she wouldn't tell anyone about their conversation. So then Agata, she disappeared in a fan of light and Kiara was left all alone. So Kiara races home and as soon as she gets home, Alaria pounces on her and she's like, where have you been? And uh, Kiara, you know, she wasn't the best at like lying and stuff and she really did want to tell her sister, especially her sister who believed in fairies and magic and would just love to hear all this stuff but she had made a promise not to tell and so since she wasn't very good at lying she settled for what was technically the truth she told her that she had been on her way to their mother and father's bakery where she you know helps out with some of the bookkeeping and stuff like that but she had forgotten the ledger and she was just running home really quick to grab it and then go back to the bakery. Now, obviously, Alaria knew she was lying and this really impacted her. Her sister never lied to her, never kept things from her. So this was the very first crack in Alaria's heart. Now, as the week passed, resentment built up in Alaria's heart. She was trying to figure out what the fairy could have possibly wanted with Kiara. We know Kiara doesn't believe in magic or wishes, so Kiara couldn't have made a wish and that was why the fairy was there to like grant her a wish. Or maybe she had. I mean, why else would a fairy be there? Now throughout the week, Alaria was so mad at her sister that she was kind of like avoiding her and she'd make up excuses why she wasn't coming home at night like she had to work late or she had to help you know with stuff at their parents bakery or whatever. Now one of these nights she was just kind of hanging out at the bakery by herself so she wouldn't have to go home and she went and she found the spot where her parents keep their profits from the day if there is any they're not you know well off people most of the people in this village are not in fact most of them are just scraping by anyway so she sees their profits for the day and it's not much and she's feeling bad about this i mean who wouldn't and she tells herself you know when I'm a famous opera singer, Mama and Papa, they won't have to work at all. And in fact, they'll live in the fanciest house in Boulogne, right across the street from mine. Now that evening when Alaria was coming home, right before she opened the door, she heard voices inside the house. And her mother was saying, are you sure this is what you want, my dove? And Kiara's answering, she's like, yes. I've decided, you know, I want to do the trial. And Alaria's like, trial? What the heck is she talking about? And then she hears someone else, else's voice say, you know, don't worry, we'll take good care of your daughter. And Alaria's thinking, who's that? She's like, I don't recognize that voice. She goes barging into the house before she misses anything else, but it's too late. Her mom and dad, they're getting up from their chairs and Alaria or Kiara is racing up the stairs. So she had missed whatever just happened. So she asks her mom and dad, she's like, what's going on? And her parents are like, oh, you just missed a fairy. And Alaria's like, a fairy? And she's like, yeah, you know, we waited for you as long as we could, but the fairy, she had to go. And she's like, what was the fairy doing here? And her mother tells her that, you know, they had invited Kiara to go to the wishing star and possibly see if she would like to become a fairy herself. And that Kiara had her parents' blessing. Now that was the last thing <laughs> Alaria expected to hear. Then Kiara comes down the stairs and she's like, yeah, she's like, I'm leaving in two weeks to 
do an apprenticeship. Alaria's like, well, nobody asked me what I thought about this. And Alaria, she's like, how can you leave me to Kiara? And Kiara said, you know, I haven't said I'm leaving yet. She's like, it's just a, a trial to see if I like it and to see if the other fairies like me. I haven't said I'm leaving. And Alaria's like, well, what about my audition? You had promised to go with me, you know, trying to make Kiara feel guilty. And Kiara explains to her, she's like, you know, I, I need to take this chance. I need to discover, you know, my talents. And besides, she's like, it's only a trial. I won't be gone forever. And Alaria's like, but you know, what if you decide you want to stay forever? What if you decide to become a fairy? And Kiara's like, you know, I really don't think I'm going to. She's like, I would miss you too much. Then, you know, Alari is like, well, what if, you know, I really do make it into the conservatory and you become a fairy? She's like, will we still be together? Kiara's like, of course. She's like, we're sisters. We'll always be together. And this, you know, kind of eased Alaria's fear and anger. But, I mean, neither of them could have known that Kiara, her words, would not turn out to be the truth. Now the news of Kiara becoming a fairy or getting the chance to study to become a fairy spread across the town like wildfire and no one could contain their excitement about it. Now Geppetto, he wasn't surprised at all that the fairies were interested in Kiara. After uh, she had rescued him, she befriended him and her and her siblings would come and visit him quite often and he really looked forward to seeing all of them. But he also knew that Alaria was probably not happy about Kiara going off to study with the fairies because he knew that the sisters were close. Now soon it was Alaria's last day at home and her parents threw a little party and half of the town showed up and there Geppetto gave her a gift. He gave her um, a little wooden dove that he had carved because that's what her parents called her, their little dove, because she brought peace to the family and it was also her favorite bird. Now at the party, Alaria was feeling ignored because everyone only wanted to talk to Kiara. So she left the party and she took a walk down by the seaside and there she was like looking into the water. She saw these like dark shadows forming in the water and it kind of scared her and she thought, oh, Monstro? And she said, Monstro? Like out loud. And she heard a voice and this shadow gather in the water and she goes, oh no, I'm not Monstro. Though he is a friend, he's sleeping right now, but he'll awaken soon enough. And Alaria's uh, alarmed and she's like, who are you? And she's like, no, 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 correction, what are you? And the shadow says, I am embraced by the forgotten, the unwanted, and the unworthy. Isn't that how you've been feeling lately, Alaria? And she had, it seemed like, you know, to her, her whole life, everyone always focused on Kiara. She felt like even her own parents preferred Kiara over her, even though of course they would never admit that. Now the shadow said to her, you've been a shadow your whole life to your sister. She's like, why do you tolerate that? And then she just disappeared. And when Alaria got home, it was very late. But Kiara had stayed up waiting for her and she was in her room and Kiara was like, hey, she's like, you know, I've been waiting for you. And she's like, why? She's like, mother and father didn't even stay up for me. Kiara's like, well, where were you? And she was like, I went for a walk by the ocean. And Kiara's like, by yourself? And Alaria's like, well, I certainly didn't go with you. She was, you know, kind of trying to hurt her feelings. And Alaria was like, it doesn't matter anyway. Nobody missed me. And Kiara was like, well, I missed you. And Alaria's, you know, she's like, well, if you care about me so much, then don't leave with the fairies tomorrow. And Kiara, she tries to, you know, reason with her. She's like, listen, Alaria, she's like, 
you know, how does music make you feel? And with some prodding, she finally got uh, Alaria to admit that she loves music because it makes her feel alive. And Kiara was telling her, she's like, you know, that's how helping people makes me feel. She was trying to get her to understand why she was leaving. It wasn't because she didn't care about her, but Alaria, she wasn't hearing it. She was a little too, you know, caught up in her own feelings. And Kiara, you know, she assured Alaria that, you know, she would be fine. She's got her audition going on and she should be focused on that. And this did help Alaria feel better. Now, the next morning, Agata showed up and it was time for her and Kiara to leave. And Alaria asked the Violet Fairy, she was like, you know, how long is Kiara gonna be gone? And she told, you know, her family that she would have until the winter, which was like five months from then, to complete her studies. Alaria asked if Kiara could write. And the Violet Fairy, she was like, you know, we don't really like our initiates to correspond with their families because then they kind of have, you know, one foot at home still and one foot in their studies and it, they want their students to focus. But she would have five months to complete her studies. And Alaria was like, oh great, five months? That means she'll be back in time for my birthday. What happens after the five months? And uh, the Violet Fairy was like, then Kiara will come home for a week and she'll have to decide whether she's going to return to her life before or if she's gonna go back to the wishing star and become a full-fledged fairy. Then Agata, she waved her magic wand and her and Kiara disappeared in a fan of light. So Kiara closed her eyes and when she opened them, the Violet Fairy was saying, Welcome to the Wishing Star. And before Kiara was a little village, not a lot unlike Pariva. There was a bunch of little cottages, all different colors. There was uh, pink, orange, gold, mahogany, every color you can think of, right? And the streets were lined with silver and copper and gold trees and there was a crystal house in the center of all of it. This was like the little, you know, headquarters. Then over a dozen fairies started filing out of their houses, each in a different color. And the first one walks up to Kiara and she says, welcome Kiara, we've been expecting you. And this fairy was in all gold. And she tells Kiara, she's like, I'm Marabella the Gold. I'm the mother of fairies of sorts, though really I'm just, you know, been serving on the Wishing Star the longest. And she's like, you know, you'll find that being a, a fairy is not a whole lot different than being a girl in Pariva. She's like, you'll eat and sleep in your own cottage and you'll make friends among the other fairies. And she asks Kiara, she's like, do you have any questions so far? And Kiara's like, yeah, she's like, how long does one serve as a fairy? And Maribel's like, oh, you know, you serve as long as you want to. And Kiara's like, okay. And each fairy is represented by a color. And uh, Maribel is like, she's like, yeah, you know, it kind of just started out as like nicknames, but it kind of stuck. And I think blue's available. I sense it's been waiting for you. Then all the fairies, they, you know, go about their business and Agata takes Kiara to her cottage. And it's blue, of course, and it has little doves painted, painted on it. And she also shows her her wishing well, which every cottage has a wishing well on its grounds. And from the wishing well is where you can see a map of wishes being wished <laughs> and how high the water was in the well represented how much magic was on earth because magic is limited apparently 
it buds from bravery, kindness, and nobleness. So the more hope that the fairies spread, the more magic there was for them to work with. Then a fan of blue light emanated from the wishing well and a map emerged. And then thousands of little golden dots appeared on the map. Now each one of these little golden dots represents a wish that has been made recently. And Agata tells Kiar that once she gets her wand, she'll be assigned an area to observe. And her duty would be to listen to all of them and deem which ones were worthy of their attention and magic. And Kiara's like, well, how will I know which ones are worthy of our magic? And Agata's like, well, you know, therein lies the tricky part. <laughs> She's like, that's why we need fairies. Agata's like, there's all different kinds of wishes. There's selfless wishes, there's selfish wishes, and then there's all the different kinds in between. But we listen to all of them. But we tend to give more attention to wishes that come from the heart. Also, big rule, fairies are not allowed to grant wishes to anyone that they used to know. That way, they can't be accused of favoritism. Now, Agata goes on to explain, she's like, now we listen to all wishes, but we never respond to any wishes that wish for, you know, something bad to happen to another person. And Kiara's like, oh, well, then why do we even listen to those wishes at all? And Agata explains to her that there are other fairies that dwell in the arena of evil and that those fairies do listen to those wishes and try to grant them. So the wishing fairies need to be aware of these wishes so that they'll be able to undo any harm that the evil fairies cause. Now, Agata explains to Kiara that these other fairies, they call them the Heartless. That they're led by Amorale the Grey and Larissa the Green. And that these fairies, they specialize in fostering hatred and envy among people. And Kiara's like, well, why would they do that? And Agata explains to them that, you know, just like us wishing fairies, we gain power and magic from the joy that we spread. The heartless gain power from uh, the negativity that they spread because it's far easier to spread hate and misunderstanding and get people to argue than it is to get people to love each other, which we all know that's true. Now, Larissa and Amorale had once been wishing fairies, had been part of the good fairies. But once they figured out that it was easier to gain power through negativity, they formed the Heartless. And what they'll do is they'll heap misery onto somebody's life and then go to that person and offer them a way out. They'll make a deal with them. Um, but it's very rare that the person they make this deal with can actually pay them back. Now, fortunately, Agata goes on to say, we can undo most of the damage that they caused. And Kiara was like, most? And she's like, yeah. She's like, uh, you know, every once in a while, the Heartless will offer someone to become one of them. And in order to do that, they have to destroy their own heart. And that's why they call them the Heartless. And once that has been done, there's no reversing it. Now after that, every day, Kiara would shadow Agata uh, and learn firsthand what it meant to attend to the wishes of the brave, the truthful, and the selfless. Now, a few months later, it was time for Alaria's audition in Vallon. Now, um, Alaria had hired someone 
to take her to the city in a carriage. But when the person showed up, it was actually a wagon. And this really annoyed Alaria. She couldn't show up in the city of the lawn in a, in a wagon drugged by donkeys, not even horses. But she had to go because, you know, none of her family uh, could go with her, which really hurt her. It made her feel like they didn't care about, you know, her big day. Except Geppetto cared and he offered to accompany her so she wouldn't have to go alone. And the two had, you know, they'd become friends since Chiara had left. You know, Geppetto, of course, he has feelings for Alaria. Um, and Alaria, you know, she is starting to see him in uh, a little bit different light that maybe he could be more than a friend. Now on their way there, Geppetto gave her a gift. It was a music box that he had made and it played her favorite song, the Nightingale Aria. Aria is a word we learned in our last Beauty in the Bibliophile. Anyway, so he had made her this uh, music box as a gift and the song, the Nightingale Aria, she would be singing that song on her uh, audition. Now Laria loved the music box and told him that she was gonna treasure it forever. And when Alaria got to her audition, it didn't go so great. <laughs> she was a few minutes late and she was singing her song and they cut her off and they were just like, oh, that'll be all. And Alaria's like, but I didn't finish. And the you know person in charge of the uh, audition, he was like, uh, well, you know, if you had arrived on time, you would have had more time to sing. And this pissed Alaria off. She's like, uh, do you know what it took for me to get here? She had had to <laughs> hire someone to bring her there. She had to work in a job she hated to, you know, hire that person and to get the dress she needed and all this stuff. Family didn't care. And the guy running the audition, he was like, uh, you know, we judge on the quality of your voice, not on the hardship it takes for someone to get to their audition on time. And Alaria's like, but I have practiced. And Maria Linda speaks up then. And she's like, what? You've practiced for months? years she's like you're not alone in that maria linda was like you know you're a lovely girl and you have a lovely voice but that's all you are she was like a prima donna cannot just be lovely the stars themselves have to bow down to her when she enters a room she was like you know i we thank you for your time but we don't think that the conservatory is a match for your efforts you may go and with those three little words Alaria's dreams were over and she stormed out crying you know outside Geppetto was waiting for her and when he saw her crying he was like oh he's like are you okay what's wrong and uh Alaria she was like it was stupid she's like it was all stupid she's like they didn't even let me finish she's like let's go home and you know Geppetto was trying to make her feel better and he's like you know don't worry about it fate is kind you'll get a second chance you'll get your dreams and Alaria was thinking to herself she's thinking you know no fate is not kind she'd always known it she should have known better first it took uh Chiara from her and now her dreams Alaria would always be second rate. Now when she got home, she told her family that uh, she had gotten into the conservatory, that things had gone great, and that she would be leaving for Valon in the winter. And when she got up to her room, she was extremely depressed. And she looked for the wishing star. And she was like, Kiara, where are you? She's like, I need you, I miss you. Alaria was thinking, you know, it was so un that Chiara, who would have been happy staying in Pariva her entire life, was out exploring the world and she was stuck in this little town, unwanted and never good enough. And she's thinking to herself, you know, 
fate isn't kind. Geppetto was wrong and she kept repeating this to herself over and over until she cried herself to sleep. But little did she know that there was someone listening and watching. Someone who did have the power to change her fate. Now, when the winter came, Kiara had been on the Wishing Star for five months. And that day when Kiara went to Agata's house for her lesson, she, Agata, could tell that Kiara was a little off, a little down. And Kiara told her that, you know, she missed her family, that it had been, it was five months that day and it was Alaria's birthday. And Agata was like, oh, she's like, you know what? You're right. I, I guess it's time for you to go home. And Kiara tells um, Agata, she's like, you know, I don't know. How am I supposed to make this decision? And Agata's like, well, you know, maybe I ought to uh, actually tell you everything you need to know in order to make this decision. Kiara's like, she's like, well, you know, I kind of know already. I know that if I decide to become a fairy, that my age will be suspended. And, uh, you know, all my friends and my family, they'll continue to age and eventually they'll die. And all, everyone I've ever known will pass on and I'll lose everybody eventually. And Agatha's like, Yes, but uh, there's more. Agata tells her that, you know, if you choose to go back to your family, you'll forget your time here on the Wishing Star. And Kiara's like, and if I choose to stay? And Agata's like, well, then you will have to cast a spell on everyone you know that will make them forget you. And, you know, Agata explains to her, she's like, you know, no, if the choice is totally up to you, she's like, nobody is forced into doing this. But, you know, magic is particular. It, it doesn't speak to everyone, yet spoke to you, and it led me to you. And you will be able to observe your family from your wishing well, but you won't be able to grant them any wishes. That will be another fairy's you know, decision if it's fitting. And, you know, this is obviously the hardest rule for all of them. And it'll take a very long time to get over. And Kiara's like, okay, well, you know, this is a lot to think about. Let me go home and see if I can figure this out. So Kiara goes, she heads home. Now, when Alaria found out that Kiara was home, she raced home and you know the family they visited for a while but then after a while um uh, alaria took kiara back to her old room to change um kiara was still in her fairy gown and while uh kiara was getting dressed alaria was just full of questions she's like tell me everything she's like what kind of magic can you do and uh, Kiara told her, you know, actually, since I'm only an apprentice, the only magic I can do is when I'm on the wishing star. She's like, I don't even have, you know, my wand yet. And Alaria's like, you don't have your own wand yet? She's like, I've been doing these past five months. And Kiara told her that, you know, mostly honing my sense of right and wrong. It's what the fairies call it, your conscience. And we've been visiting people across the world that could use a little extra guidance. And Alaria's like, but what about wishes? She's like, aren't you granting wishes? And Kiara's like, well, you know, actually granting wishes is probably what we do the least. She's like, mostly we look after people's hearts. She tells her, she's like, you know, I have a map that will tell me, you know, how someone's heart is doing, how they're doing emotionally. And uh, Alaria is just like, oh, really? Because, you know, she hasn't been doing so great lately. And Kiara's like, yeah, and it's shown me yours. And 
I know you've been sad lately. And Alaria's like, well, you know, why would I be sad? She's like, I've gotten everything I've always wanted. I'm, I'm in the conservatory now. And Kiara, she's like, she's like, don't lie to me. She's like, I know something happened at your audition. What really happened? And Alaria, she's like, you know, it's no good lying to her, I guess. So she told her the truth. She was like, I didn't get in. But, you know, who wants to be a, a stupid opera singer anyway? And Kiara tells her, she's like, don't give up. And she's like, it's your dream. She's like, you'll find your way. She's like, you know, but you gotta tell everybody the truth. And Alaria, she's like, yeah, I know. She's like, but can I at least wait till after my birthday? I don't wanna spoil the day. I don't wanna spoil, you know, your time back. And she's like, besides, you're back now. She's like, everything's great. You'll make everything right again. And she goes, running into her sister's arms and Kiara was taken a little aback by this and she was like well you know I'll do anything on that I can and Alaria's like really and Kiara's like yes of course I'm your sister then Alaria shows Kiara the music box that Geppetto had made for her and she tells Kiara that he had made it for her to bring her luck to her audition but obviously it didn't work and now it only kind of brings pain to her heart. And she was like holding it and standing in front of her hearth, with, which is like, you know, a little heater type thing. And she kind of leaned towards the flames, like she was gonna toss the box into the flames. And Kiara's like, Alaria, no, no, don't do that. She's like, that was his gift to you. And Alaria's like, Yes, I know, but it brings me no joy to see it now. And Kiara's like, well, then I'll keep it. She's like, at least until you're feeling better. And Alaria, she's like, oh, you know, I'm so glad you're back. You know, you're going to make everything right. It feels like all my dreams are going to come true now. And Kiara's like, well, you know, that's my job now. And Alaria's like, so it is. Now, Kiara had no idea that she was playing right into Alaria's hands and that that is what Alaria had counted on her to say. Now, on the morning of the seventh day and possibly last day of Kiara being at home, she goes into Alaria's room to get her for breakfast. And Alaria tells her that, you know what? I've decided that I'm gonna let you become a fairy. And Kiara's like, come again? Alaria's like, you know, I know it's your dream and I know that it's, you've already decided. And I could kick up a fuss about it, but you know, I'm an adult now, I'm, I'm 17 now, so I'm not going to complain. And Kiara's like, well, thank you, but uh, you want me to go? And Alaria's like, yes, I, I know that's what would make you happy, but it would be nice if you gave me a farewell gift though. And Kiara was immediately on guard. She's like, uh, a gift? What kind of gift? And Alaria's like, you know, I wish I hadn't lied to everyone about getting into the conservatory, but then I remembered my sister is a fairy. A fairy who said she would make all my dreams come true. Kiara did not like where this was going. Kiara was like, uh, Alaria, that's against the rules. But Alaria didn't hear her. She's like, come on, Kiara. She's like, make me the greatest opera singer in the world, greater than Maria Linda. She's like, think of what I could do. I could take care of Mama and Papa and Niccolo forever. She's like, think of how it would bring attention to their bakery and the whole town of Pariva would benefit from it. And Kiara's like, you're not listening. She's like, even if I wanted to, I can't. It's against the rules because you're my sister. And Alaria was like, yeah, exactly. I'm your sister, so you should do this for me. And Kiara's like, I can't be seen giving favors to my friends and family. And Alaria's like, I won't tell anybody. And Kiara was like, no. And Alaria's face darkened. And she was like, 
you have helped everyone in Pariva your whole life. Now help the person who loves you the most. And again, Kiara's like, I can't. And Alaria's persisting and please, she's like, music is all I have. And now the conservatory doesn't want me. There'll always be somebody better unless you help me. She's like, if I stay in Pariva, I will waste away to nothing. And Kiara's like, that's not true. She's like, you'll make your way. Then Alaria's like, let me get this straight. You have the power to help your friends and family and you're choosing not to. And she's like, you would abandon me. You would abandon your family. This whole town, everyone's always said that you were the selfless one. But I think now I'm starting to understand. Eternal youth, magic, you can go anywhere you want, be anything you want. She's like, I hate you and I wish I never had a sister. Now, of course, this really hurt uh, Kiara. She wanted to give Alaria the music box back, but she knew that at this point there was nothing she could say. So she just put the uh, music box on Alaria's vanity and goes to walk out the door. And when Alaria sees the music box, she's just so enraged, she grabs it, and she throws it across the room, it hits the wall, and then lands on the ground. So Kiara, she goes downstairs and she tells her family her decision, that she's going to go back to the Wishing Star. And they're, of course, you know, polite about it and they support her, though they're sad. Then Kiara, she goes outside just to be alone because she's, you know, it's a mix of feelings. She's happy, excited to start her life, but of course, she's also sad because she's leaving her family, not just, you know, leaving them, but they'll forget her completely. So she goes outside to be alone and her mentor shows up, Agata. And Kiara tells her the decision that she's made that she wants to be a fairy. And Agata says that's wonderful and she gives her her wand and wings. And Agata asks her, she's like, so what name will you take? And that was easy for Kiara. She's like, the blue fairy. Blue was her favorite color. It brought her joy and it reminded her of home. Then the violet fairy told her that she would have until sunset the next day to cast her forgetting spell on the town. And, you know, in the meantime, they were going to go back to the wishing star for a little celebration. Now that evening, Kiara snuck out of the house. She needed to get out of town. She didn't know where she was going, but she knew she had to get out of town before Kiara tampered with her memories. So she finally decided she was gonna go to Geppetto's house. She wanted him to run away with her. So she hurries over there, and when she passes the Red Lobster Inn, she like hears footsteps behind her, like someone's following her. So she picks up the pace and she turns a corner, but a carriage like wheels in front of her and cuts her off. A man jumped out and asked her, he's like, you know, what's a pretty little thing like you doing out at this time of night and uh, what's in your bag there? Then another man came up behind her and grabbed her probably, you know, the presence that she had felt behind her. And she was kicking and screaming, but one of the guys pulled out a knife and held it to her throat and was like, scream all you want, little donkey. But then they both like let go of her and started like grasping at their throats like they couldn't breathe and they fell to their knees. And Alaria looks up and there's a woman in all green standing there. And the woman says, that's no way to treat a rising star like you, Alaria. She's like, tell me, she's like, should we punish these men? And Alaria, she like regains her composure and she's like, yes, we should punish them. And the woman, she pulls out a magic wand and Alaria's like, this, this lady a fairy? She didn't look like any fairies she'd seen. So the lady's like, so what do you say, Alaria? How should we punish them? Alaria's like, turn them into donkeys, since that's what they had called her. The lady's like, as you wish. And 
she turned them into donkeys and then her wand turned into a whip and she started lashing at them and she's like get get and they go running off and then the lady turns to Ilaria and she's like so you wish to be a great diva she's like uh I can help you with that and Ilaria's like yeah that's what everyone says and the lady in the green she's like uh Oh, yeah, your sister lied to you, didn't she? That's not surprising. The woman told Alaria that she was a fairy. And Alaria's like, you're not a fairy. And the lady says, well, you know, I'm, I'm not like any fairy that you've known. She's like, my name is Larissa the Green, and I am a mistress of the night. And she walks up to Alaria, and she wipes a little bit of blood off of her lip and she says you know red suits you it's the color of passion just like you how passionate you are about being an opera singer but you know you could be far more than just a, a stage performer if you wished it and Alaria's like oh you're gonna grant me a wish and the lady's like well I'm not really in the business of wish granting uh i think more of it like uh making a deal and kiara's like what kind of deal she's like well you know you want to be a an opera singer your sister you know she couldn't understand that but me i get it she's like if you want my honest opinion i i really think your sister wouldn't grant your wish because she didn't want you to outshine her and Alaria's like, no, she's like, Kiara, she's just following rules. That's what she does. And uh, Larissa's like, yes, uh, rules that you would have broken for her if you had been in her place, right? And Alaria's like, yeah, yeah, I would have. The green fairy says, you know, I can make all your dreams come true. And Alaria's like, you don't look like a fairy. And Larissa's like, well, you know, I don't run in the same circles as your sister. My circle actually cares. Now, Ilaria knew that, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And so she's like, well, what do you want in exchange for this wish that you're going to grant me? And Larissa says, your heart. <laughs> and Ilaria's like, uh, my heart? Uh new and Larissa the green she's like oh I see you you drive a hard bargain apparently I need to offer you more okay how about this not only will I make you a famous opera singer but I will also give you magic magic that would rival your sisters in every way possible and Alari's like but I'm not evil and Larissa's like evil she's like well is it evil to take what you deserve some would say that's wisdom or or strength even she's like you know your heart it just gets in the way it's it's a weakness then she said you know i'm not gonna give you another chance to take this offer she's like you know over time your beauty and youth will fade your voice too you know maybe you'll marry that toy maker and spit out a few brats and live in Pariva forever. And Aloria, she like put her hand on her chest. She was, you know, still aching from the fight that she had had with Kiara. She had a broken heart and it was painful. And the green fairy goes on to say, you know, Kiara, she'll do wonders for some people on the world. Some, she'll do some good. And I guess that's fine, but you, you could uplift your entire town. You could reward everyone who's ever been good to you and punish anyone who thought you were unworthy. And Alaria's like, but in exchange for my heart? And Larissa's like, yeah, she's like, you won't miss it. Again, it only causes pain. And Alaria had to agree with her because that's what she was experiencing right at that moment. And Larissa's like, you know, the pain of a broken heart can kill you. She's like, is that what you want, Alaria? She's like, you know, even if all your dreams come true, she's like, you become a famous opera singer and all this stuff. 
it'll still only last a few short years. She's like, if you become a fairy, if you become one of us, she's like, you'll be young forever, you'll never die, and all I need is your heart that's causing you pain anyway. She's like, shall I take it? And Alaria says, yes. Then a mist emanated from Larissa and that formed into claws and tightened over Alaria's chest. And in a flash of light, it was all over. Larissa put Alaria's heart in the music box that Geppetto had made for her. She turns to Alaria and she says, so how do you feel? And the only word that really entered Alaria's mind was empty. She didn't have any of the, you know, constant inner dialogue of, you know, things that hurt you, your hopes, your dreams, your, you know, nagging at yourself that's always going on in your head. And she looked at Larissa and she goes, you know, I feel free. And Larissa said, well, then you've taken the first step at becoming a heartless. And she handed her the music box back and Alari is like, well, what do I do with this? And Larissa says, destroy it. Then you will have proven yourself worthy of becoming a full-fledged heartless. And then she gave Alaria a wand. She told Alaria to go to her family, tell them everything that happened, offer them riches and all the wishes that they wanted. But don't tell Kiara, make sure that you destroy your heart and you'll become one of us. And Alaria's like, I'll do it. And Larissa's like, great. You'll feel so much better once it's all done. Now the first thing Alaria did was go to Geppetto's. She was gonna ask him to run away with her. And he was up late working on some of his toys. And he was surprised to see her at you know such a late hour. He's like, what are you doing out right now? And she told him, she's like, going to Valon and I want you to come with me. She's like, I can now uh, make you the most famous toy maker there ever was. If that's what you want, I'll make you famous and rich. And he's like, uh, he's like, I don't do this for money. He's like, I don't want to be famous. And she's like, okay, what do you want then? And he's like, I want to take you home. He's like, you're out late and your parents will be worried. Alaria's like, you fool. She's like, fine, you don't want to come with me? Then I'm going to make you forget. I'm going to make you forget we ever knew each other. And she disappears. And Geppetto blinks his eyes and he's like, uh, what was I doing? <laughs> he's like, why did I put on my coat and hat? And why is the door open on such a cold night? So he just goes back to working on his toys. Now the next day, Kiara searched for her sister. She felt bad about their argument and she didn't want that to have been their last conversation before she cast her memory spell. So she goes to their house and she goes into her room and she's not in there. Her bed is neatly made and the music box is sitting on her bed. Kiara goes over to it and she's looking at it and she pulls out the little dove that Geppetto had made for her. And she's looking at the two things and you could totally tell that, you know, they were made by the same artist. And then she notices that the music box is heavier than normal and it's warm. She opens it up and she sees something that she did not expect. She thought she was gonna hear the tune that uh, Geppetto had programmed into it, but instead there was a heart, Alaria's heart, she could only assume. And she's like, oh dear God, Alaria, what have you done? And she didn't even notice that the little wooden dove fell out of her lap when she stood up. And Kiara's like, show yourself, Alaria. And right then, Alaria materializes right in front of her. And Kiara's like, what have you done? Alaria's like, what? And she goes, oh, looking at the, the music box. She goes, well, I see you've uh, found my heart. And Alaria's like, please tell me you did not make a deal with the Heartless. And Alaria's like, what? She's like, you know, 
I've cast my own little spell. And Kiara's like, what spell? She's like, you know, you said I was going to find a way to make all my dreams come true, and I have. All of Pariva is going to remember me as the most famous prima donna in all the land. And she's like, what are you, jealous? And Kiara's like, no, I'm not jealous. She's like, yes, you are. She's like, mom and dad, they're gonna remember me fondly, and they're not even gonna remember that you existed. And everyone said that I was the selfish one. She's like, did you know that mama cries herself to sleep every night because you're leaving? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure the forgetting spell is gonna make everything all better. Kiara was like, you know, by choosing the Heartless, you're going down a bad path. And Alaria's like, what? What, like I'm a villain? She's like, would a villain offer mama and papa riches and Niccolo whatever he wanted and Geppetto to run away with me and be rich and famous? She's like, I mean, they all turned me down but that's on them and they'll regret that. It's their loss, I have a new family now. And Kiara's like, uh, those heartless people, they're not your family, they don't care about you. She's like, please, take your heart back. And Alaria, she reaches out, she takes the box, but then she holds it up and points her wand at it and she sets it on fire. And Kiara lunges for it, she knocks it out of her hand and. Uh, she puts the fire out, but then in retaliation, Alaria points her wand at the little wooden dove that had fallen on the ground, and she points her wand and the magic comes out of the wand, and then Kiara is able to intercept her magic with her own magic. But then the weirdest thing happens. The dove becomes real. Its wooden uh, wings become real and it flies out the window. Then Kiara made the music box with Alaria's heart disappear so that Alaria couldn't ever get to it and destroy it. Now, the two sisters kind of looked in astonishment, like what had just happened? I mean, Alaria, she couldn't have cared less what their two magics had just accomplished. And she turns to Kiara, she's like demanding that she give her heart back to her so she could destroy it. But Kiara is like, no, I'm not giving it to you until you're ready to receive it. And Alara is like, well, that's fine. Sooner or later, I'll get it back. You're gonna hand it to me yourself. For now, I'm very excited to figure out what my powers can do and just kind of move on. And then she disappeared in a plume of red smoke. And Kiara was very sad. She goes and she sits on Alaria's bed and she's crying. And just then, the little dove comes flying back into the window and sits on her shoulder. Now, Kiara knew that, you know, it was against the rules to give inanimate objects life permanently. Um, but she couldn't change him back without Alaria's help, since it had taken both of their magics to do it. So she assumed <laughs> it would take both of their magics to reverse it. So she's like, well, you know, little dove, I guess you're just gonna have to stay with me until we get Alaria back. It was sunset now, and she had one last thing she had to do before she returned to the Wishing Star. She had to make everyone forget. She had to cast that spell. So she goes to her old room, and she pulls out her wand, and she says, little town of Pariva, you will have my heart forevermore but we must part and forget me. And then a light swells out from her wand and it cascades uh, through her house and over the whole town of Pariva. She watched her bedroom transform into a storage room. It had flour and books and memories laying around that no longer included her. Then she made herself invisible. She goes downstairs to look in on her family one last time and she promises her parents in her heart that she would bring Alaria and her heart back together. And then she flew back to the wishing star. Now over the past few months, 
in the surrounding towns and villages that were around Pariva, a lot of boys had gone missing. At first, everyone just thought it was co coincidence. But the more and more boys that went missing, it was becoming obvious that there was something going on and the fairies needed to investigate. And Kiara was put on the case. She searched for the missing boys and she found clues of like dark magic going on and, and rumors about an island that came to life at night. But she couldn't find the island and she couldn't find a connection between the island and the missing boys. But Kiara was certain this had something to do with the Heartless. She just hadn't figured out how exactly yet. Now Kiara didn't know it, but uh, her sister had been put in charge of Pleasure Island. It was the first like big responsibility that Larissa had given her. And it was going well, um, but she was growing tired of it. She was sick of hearing the donkeys well past midnight and she was just tired of it. She felt like she was just like some sort of glorified shepherdess, like getting the donkeys to go into the wagons and carts to be taken back to the mainland to be sold. Now, all of this was generate, generating a lot of, you know, dark negative magic for the heartless. And it was also pretty profitable, it turned out. But Alaria felt like she had better things to do with her time than be tied down to this carnival on Pleasure Island like finding her heart. Now one night as she was watching over the carnival, she saw a shimmer of light shoot across the sky and she followed it and figured out that it was her sister flying into Pariva, somewhere that Alaria knew she wasn't supposed to loiter. So she continues to watch her and she sees her break all of the fairy's cardinal rules. She watched her grant a wish to someone that she once knew and cherished, and she saw her give life to an inanimate object when life is not hers to give. And she had done it all in secret without the approval of her elder fairies. So she continues to keep an eye on her. She lands on the roof of a workshop that used to be Mr. Tomasio's now Geppetto's workshop. She saw him inside working. He was an old man now. And she's thinking to herself, okay, I got my sister now. I've got her in the perfect position to get my heart back. And she sees her outside the window. And she says, oh, still making promises you know you can't keep. Well, I guess things never change. So now we're back at the beginning of the story. So after some catty talk between the two of them. They make a deal. Uh, Alaria tells her, you know, prove that Pinocchio can be good and stay out of trouble for three days and I'll help you turn him into a real boy. And Kiara starts to say, but we can't, you know, and Alaria is like, well, why? Why can't we? Because it's against the rules. Well, yes, it is against the rules, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. We've done it before. And she kind of eyes the little dub sitting on Kiara's shoulder. But Kiara still tells her no. And Alaria's like, I know, I know. You're gonna go to Marabella and to Agata and you're gonna tell them that it was out of love that you did this. But you know, rules are rules. She's probably going to make you reverse your spell on Pinocchio. And then where will that leave Geppetto? I mean, he'll be heartbroken. I can already hear what Amarabella would say, you know, a boy who can't be good might as well be made of wood. The Blue Fairy is like, you know, I have faith in Pinocchio that he will be a good boy. And Alaria is like, well then, why won't you take my wager if you're so sure? And Alaria's like, still no? Okay, well, you still haven't heard the sweetest part of the deal. And Kiara's like, yeah, what's that? She's like, if you win, I'll give you what you've been wanting the most. And Kiara's like, oh yeah, what's that exactly? And Alaria's like, I'll take my heart back. Every ounce of reason 
told Kiara not to make this deal. Agata would not approve and more than likely, if she found out, she'd be cast out from the fairies forever. But for 40 years, Kiara has been trying to figure out a way to get Alaria off this dark path that she had just chosen. But she couldn't do that unless Alaria had her heart. But then Alaria goes on. She says, but if you lose, you'll have to give me your heart. She's like, it's only fair. She's like, you know, a heart for a heart. You'll become a mistress of despair, just like me, and we'll finally be on the same side, just like you've always wanted, right? And Kiara's like, uh, no. <laughs> and Alaria's like, well, I guess this is where we say goodbye then. And Kiara thought to herself, you know, well, maybe the wishing fairies didn't always, you know, think about, um, you know, how good and evil aren't absolutes, that there's different shades in between. Maybe they had been, you know, a little harsh in determining what was good and evil. So Kiara accepts her challenge and Alaria is like, great, and she disappears. Now, half a day later, Alaria had a meeting of the fairies to attend to and Agata sees her there. She's no longer her mentor now she's now her friend and she sees her and she's like hey are, are you okay you look down and um kiara's like oh you know she she could never lie to her so she just deflected instead and she told her something that wasn't not true she told her that you know she she was really worried about monstro being so close to pariva lately and, you know, the wishing fairies had 40 years ago, they had put Monstro to sleep at the bottom of the sea. But like a week ago, the, the Heartless had found him and awakened him. And seven ships had fallen to his wrath already. Now the next morning, Geppetto sent uh, Pinocchio off to school. And the Scarlet Fairy was gonna need to keep a close eye on him. She needed to get her heart back so that she could prove herself to the Heartless. So she decided to go to the Red Lobster Inn, which was now, 40 years later, kind of a seedy place where, you know, delinquents held, hung out at. But the Scarlet Fairy and the rest of the Heartless knew that they could go there and, you know, call upon shady types to do their bidding. So she goes there and she approaches uh, Honest John and Gideon. She tells them that she has a job for them. So that evening, Pinocchio never came home for dinner and Geppetto's very worried. So he goes out looking for him. He goes to all the places where all the town's children usually play, but he can't find him. So he decides to go to the school and at the school, the teacher tells him that Pinocchio never came to school that day. So then Geppetto walks around Pariva and he's asking everybody, he's like, have you seen my boy? He's like, you can't miss him, he's made of wood. But nobody had seen him and a storm starts to roll into town. And Geppetto, his voice is hoarse from yelling out Pinocchio's name and his legs are tired. So he goes home to eat and gather his strength before he goes looking more. Elsewhere, Chiara's little dove, who she had watching Pinocchio while she tended to her fairy duties, came to Chiara and told her that Alaria had uh, Honest John and Gideon manipulating him. The dove also told the blue fairy that they had sold Pinocchio to Stromboli. Now, Chiara was very aware of who Stromboli was and what he did. He, uh, you know, traveled the countryside with his marionette show. And while his audiences were enthralled by the show, he would pickpocket them. He was just a terrible person. He had cheated his own brother out of his life savings, which then forced his brother, whose name was Vito, to work at the Red Lobster Inn at night. And to Pinocchio, he would do far worse. So she, she hurried to Stromboli's wagon where Pinocchio was trapped in a wooden cage. 
She wanted to just rescue Pinocchio and sweep him away back to Geppetto's, but she couldn't because this predicament was partially Pinocchio's fault. He didn't listen to his conscience and go to school. But for him to have run into Honest John, Gideon, and Stromboli all in one day, she knew all of this was at the hands of her sister. And there was no way Pinocchio stood a chance against her. Not without some help, at least. So she materialized right in front of Pinocchio. And she was like, what happened? She's like, why didn't you go to school? And Pinocchio's like, well, I was gonna go to school, uh, but then I met somebody. And she's like, oh, and he's like, yeah, these two big monsters with green eyes. And she's like, really, monsters? And then magic started to appear around Pinocchio's nose and it started to get longer and longer with every sentence. And Kiara's like, well, where was Sir Jiminy? And Pinocchio's like, they put him in a sack. And by this time, his nose was super long, like a, like a tree branch. And Kiara's like, well, how did you escape? And Pinocchio's like, I didn't. They chopped me into firewood, <laughs> which was obviously a lie since he's sitting right there intact. But then Pinocchio's like, what's going on with my nose? Now the blue fairy told him something that her mother used to tell her. You see, a lie keeps growing and growing until it's as plain as the nose on your face. And Pinocchio apologized profusely. He was like, I'm so sorry. He's like, I'll never lie again. And the blue fairy forgave him. And she said, but remember, a boy who can't be good might as well be made of wood. Echoing the words that Alaria had once said. So Pinocchio and Sir Jiminy, they promised to be good and she freed them from the cage. Then she disappeared, but she lingered around to keep her eye on these two. Pinocchio and Sir Jiminy, they snuck out of the wagon without Stromboli even noticing. Somebody wants to join us. So Kiara was thinking to herself, she's like, you know, what would have happened if I didn't have my little dove looking after Pinocchio? What did Alaria think that Stromboli was gonna like, influence Pinocchio and make his heart just as rotten as Stromboli's. Now so far Chiara had not proven that Pinocchio was worthy of the magic that it would take to make him a real boy. There was still two days left for that and Chiara was not going to leave Pinocchio's safety up to chance. So she goes to follow them but then she feels a dark presence and it's her sister. So Kiara told Alaria, she's like, stop interfering with Pinocchio. But Alaria refused and Kiara's like thinking to herself, she's like, why do I still have faith in <laughs> my sister? And why, why had she made this deal? Why had she broken the fairy rules? She was regretting everything. But then an answer came to her and it was because not everyone is all good or all bad which is something that Alaria used to say when they were children. It's easy to label people one or the other, but it just simply isn't true. And you know, even if Marabella and Agata disapproved of what she was doing, she knew she had to do it anyway. So she tells Alaria, she says, you know, I still have faith that Pinocchio is worthy and I still have faith that you are as well. But this, you know, annoyed Al Alaria and she just disappeared. She's like, I'll see you later. Now, meanwhile, Geppetto is out looking for Pinocchio still. He had heard rumors about Pleasure Island and how boatloads of boys were taken there. So he borrowed a friend's fishing boat and went looking for the island. But he didn't know that Monstro was lurking about looking for boats to devour. Now the Heartless had convinced Alaria to use her magic to get Monstro to eat Geppetto. They said that this would prove her devotion to them because they weren't convinced of it since she still had not destroyed her heart. So Alaria raised her wand and she cast a spell telling Monstro to swallow Geppetto and his boat whole. 
And so uh, Monstro goes after him, he opens his jaws, and then Geppetto and his boat just disappear. Now back on Pleasure Island, Pinocchio and Jiminy had arrived, but luckily the cricket caught on to the island scheme pretty quickly. And so they were able to escape. They had to dive off of a cliff into the sea. So they do that and then they go running back to Pariva to get back to Geppetto's house. Now the blue fairy had observed all of this. She knew that Geppetto was in Monstro's belly and she needed to alert Pinocchio of this. She needed to get him a message. So, you know, she writes out a magical message saying that Geppetto was trapped in the belly of a whale named Monstro and that Pinocchio needed to hurry and get him while he was still alive. And then she had her dove deliver the message to Pinocchio. And when Pinocchio and Jiminy got this message, they went into the sea to find him. Kiara had to hurry because the uh, bet with Alaria was up uh, by sunset the next day. If Pinocchio hadn't proved himself worthy of being a real boy, he would have to be turned back into a puppet forever this time, and Chiara would have to give Alaria her heart. Now, back to Geppetto in the belly of the whale. Monstro began to open his mouth to feed, and Geppetto knew he needed to take advantage of this and grab as many fish as that he could so that he wouldn't starve to death. And in all the chaos of him trying to grab fish, he didn't even notice that Pinocchio was among the fish. And when he realized this, he was so relieved and joyful. Now outside of the whale, Chiara was floating on a cloud waiting to see what was going to happen with Pinocchio. And uh, Alaria materialized right next to her along with a Morale and Larissa. They wanted Alaria to kill Chiara again as a way to prove her dedication to the Heartless. Because you know with the last test she got out on a, a technicality. They wanted Monstro to eat Geppetto and technically he did but he didn't kill him. So anyway they wanted Alaria to kill Chiara now. But in the end, Chiara couldn't do it. It was her sister. And instead, she cast a spell that put uh, a Morale and Larissa into a wine bottle that was gonna float through the sea forever. Then the two sisters waited to see what was gonna happen with Pinocchio. Inside the whale, Pinocchio had devised a plan on how to get out. They were gonna build a fire and get Monstro to sneeze them out. And that's what happened. The whale sneezed him out, but it made him very angry and he went chasing after them. And with one big wave, he took them both out. And a few minutes later, Geppetto woke up on the shore and he saw his little wooden son face down in the water. He was... Then it was sunset and the Heartless were gone and Chiara and Ilaria's wager was over. Ilaria was like, well, I guess you won. Pinocchio is a good boy. And Chiara's like, yeah, but um, it's too late now. No, you know, good or bad magic can bring the dead back. And Ilaria's like, yeah, but technically, Pinocchio was only half alive. Alaria pledged with the last of her magic that she would help bring uh, Pinocchio back. Because she wasn't a heartless anymore and she wasn't a normal fairy either. So her magic was going to be dwindling soon. So she extended her hand out to Chiara. So hand in hand, the sisters approached Pinocchio and pointed their wands at him. And they said, prove yourself brave, truthful, and unselfish and someday you will be a real boy. Awake, Pinocchio, awake. And he did. He woke up and he said, Papa, Papa, I'm alive. And Geppetto went running to him and scooped him up on his arms. And while they rejoiced, Chiara held out the music box to Alaria. 
And she said, will you take your heart back now? And Alaria said, well, if I do, am I going to forget you like everybody else? And Kiara was like, well, I don't know. I'll have to ask. Alaria's like, well, it's the right thing to do, so that's what I'll do regardless. And she took the box back and she brought it to her chest and a bunch of light emanated from it and she had her heart back. Then Alaria like instantly aged 40 years and then bells started to ring and all the other wishing fairies descended upon them. And Marabella goes up to Kiara and she goes, well, it's come to my attention that you granted a wish to Geppetto of Pariva, someone that you once knew and that you gave his wooden puppet life. And Kiara owned up to it and she said, I did. And then Marabella said to her, she's like, you know, you've made some questionable decisions, Blue Fairy, but you know, you did bring an old man who needed joy in his life, joy, and you helped a heartless get her heart back. That's never happened. And she's like, you know, maybe some of our rules need some reviewing. We may have forgotten that like not everyone is all good or, or all bad. So you'll be allowed to remain a fairy, but you did break the rules. So for punishment, you're going to be suspended from the wishing star for one year. And during that year, you'll have to spend it, you know, with your family which doesn't sound like much of a punishment to Kiara. And then after that year, you'll be reinstated. And then Agata said, you know, it's never really sat well with me that we make our families forget us. And so then all the other fairies chimed in that they agreed and they decided to make it that it's not a rule anymore. Then Agata turns to Alaria and she's like, so what are you going to do now? And, you know, now that you're not a heartless. And um, Alaria's like, I want you guys to punish me for all the bad deeds that I've done. And Marabella's like, well, you know, we're not really in the business of punishing people. She's like, uh, your conscience will do that for us. So then uh, Alaria's like, well, I, then I think I'd like a second chance with my family. And all the fairies agreed that that was best. So then they had to go around and undo all of the forgetting spells. And that took a long time. But eventually, Alaria and Kiara, they made it back to Pariva. And they went to their old house where their brother now lived with his wife and his children and his children's children. Now outside of their home, they ran into Geppetto and Pinocchio and Geppetto and Ilaria kind of got, you know, reacquainted. <laughs> and after they visited for a while, Ilaria and Chiara, they go up to the door of their old home and they knock and they hear footsteps. And it's Niccolo, he answers. And obviously overjoyed as all the memories started flooding back to him. And they go, um, is there room at dinner tonight? The end. So that was When You Wish Upon a Star, the backstory of the Blue Fairy, really. It wasn't, I mean, it was obviously a twisted tale, but also not really like, her storyline with all of this kind of corresponded with the actual storyline of the movie. One thing though that they never mentioned was the salt mines. I mean, they mentioned how they sold the donkeys back to the mainland, but in the movie, that's what they were doing. They were selling them to the salt mines as working donkeys, which is very dark and gross. Anyway, so that was this week's story. I know it was a little long, but this book was a little bit longer than most of the Twisted Tales. And so yeah, if you're interested in reading this book, I have to leave so much out for the sake of time. <laughs> These videos are always pretty long already. But if you want to read the whole story and get all the juicy details, uh, there's a link down in the description. It's not an affi affiliate link. It's just there for your convenience. And if you liked this video, let me know by giving it a thumbs up 
It's how I know what kind of videos to make and it lets me know that you care. Make sure and subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you won't miss the next twisted tale or fairy tale or some other type of book that I'm reading that week. And remember, always let your conscience be your guide. Bye. <clears throat> if you don't know what a bibliophile, <coughs> and unlike, you know, Unlike her sister, who she wanted to be a and uh, but she would have five months to complete her studies um, and then decide what she was going to do. Now Kiara closed her eyes. And, now Kiara closed her eyes and went. And with those three little words, that will be all. Kiara. Alaria's dreams were over and she stormed out crying. Nope, nope, nope. <sighs> she was like, you, she's like, until we get Kiara back. Well, a little. Uh, I can already already hear. I know, baby. I've been at this a really long time. I know. But she lingered around to keep an eye on these two. Bubs. And Kiara is thinking to herself, what would have happened if? She didn't have her dove looking after her. After him. 